Testing one, two, three. Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's such a blessing to be here uh, to start off our, our Sabbath, um, studying the book of Daniel. And before we be, go, we'll be going into our message, we're going to have our nightly quiz. And tonight's quiz, we have three questions. And I hope you guys are ready to answer the questions. Whoever gets the answer correct, um, we, we have some prizes here that you can pick from the bag. And um, if you answered the question in the past, this past week, then you are exempted from taking the quiz. Amen? You guys don't have to take the quiz, so you guys... But whoever answers the question, if you raise your hand, we have a mic in the front here. Just come down to the front, to the mic, share your answer, and then we'll give you the prizes uh, if you get it correct. So we have three questions. You guys ready for the quiz? Okay. So. Mm hmm. Technical difficulties, it's okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay, all right, we got it. Okay, so you guys ready for the quiz? First quiz. So whoever raises their hand first, um, I'll call upon you guys, and then you guys just come to the front to share your answer. All right. Question number one. What is the start date of the 70 weeks prophecy, the 2300-day prophecy, and what happened on this date? So this is a two-part question. What is the start date of the 70 weeks prophecy, and what happened on this date? Anyone want to take a stab at it? What is the start date of the 70 weeks prophecy? I think it's when they thought that Jesus would come back. I'm sorry? Good try. Would someone like to help her out? <laughs> I'll read the question again, maybe so we can understand the question. What is the start date of the 70 weeks prophecy? Not the end date. 457 BC, correct. And what happened on that date? Did that happen in 457? Does somebody would like to help her or like to phone a friend? Good try, good try, good try. Correct. Good job. Good job. Thank you so much for sharing the answer. The correct answer is that the start date, you can come up to claim your prize. The start date of the 70 weeks prophecy and the 2300 prophecy was the fall of 457 BC. The decree by King Artaxerxes was given to what everyone? Restore and rebuild Jerusalem. What is the start date of the 70 weeks prophecy, everyone? 457 BC. And what happened in 457 BC? The command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem happened 
in 457. All right, you can come down and claim your prize. I'm trying to pull it out here. Good job. All right, thank you so much. Okay, let's go to question number two. You guys ready? Question number two. In the 70 week prophecy, Jesus is mentioned as the Messiah. What two events was prophesied about the Messiah and what are those exact dates? Is there a hand out there? Any hands? We have a hand here. Okay. Jesus was his name. Uh huh. In AD 27, and Jesus. And 27, and Jesus crucifixion. All right. Wait, when did Jesus get? When did Jesus get baptized? Okay, and when did Jesus crucify? 31. 31 AD. Good job. Good job. You can come for it. Come here, grab your prize. Here you go. Congratulations. All right, so the correct answer is the 70 weeks prophecy revealed Jesus' baptism in 27 AD and Jesus' death in 31 AD. Amen? All right, last question. This one's, oh, I just picked a random bookmark. This one says marriage. Is having someone to share your dreams with, someone to share your life with through the years? Oh, this would be a nice one, okay. <laughs> All right, you guys ready for the, the question? Okay, question number three. Since 1844, what are we supposed to be doing? Preparation of the second coming. Correct. Preparation of our hearts for the second coming of Jesus. Good job. You can come up and claim your prize. <laughs> Congratulations. Good job. All right. Well, let's look at the answer. We are supposed to be doing what the Jewish people were commanded to do during the 70 weeks prophecy, which was preparing their hearts to receive Jesus the Messiah at his coming. And so that's a quick review of last night's presentation. And uh, I hope that you guys learned something. And I hope that you enjoyed the, the quiz. Um, and Praise God for those who have been answering our quiz questions. And so I hope you pay attention tonight so that we'll have our next quiz uh, tomorrow during divine service. All right. So now at this moment, I'm going to give it over to Renz. Good evening and happy Sabbath, friends. Some of you may be wondering, that's not Mark Pashon up there. Um, my name is Renz Espelita, for those of you who don't know. And uh, Mark had asked me to help him out and to, to partake in this DanRev seminar. Him and I share um, a class together for the summer, the IFE class. He might, ha he might have... Um, introduce it to you guys for the past week. Um, I, you haven't seen me because on top of this, I also have my own. Um, so Mark was in charge with the ladies, right? Um, I was in charge with the gentlemen over at Mahogany. So during the times that I wasn't here, 
I was over there. But I would have wished to be here most of the times. But as you know, we all have our responsibilities. And we are thankful because we were able to have this time of, you know, be able to connect with each other and to share God's word with each other. Now, well, all right. A little disclaimer before I start speaking. This presentation that I have today, it's not the best one that I've made because as you know, today we didn't have electricity. They were doing something with electricity, I'm not sure. It's what AUP is known for. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but today I'd like to share to you, mostly it will just be verses. And hopefully by God's grace, I will be able to share to you what I have learned um, about this, this specific part about Daniel. Tonight we'll be talking about Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12. Mostly on Daniel 10 and the end of Daniel 11 and then, the, and then the, mostly on Daniel 12. And it is talking about, it is talking about the culmination of Daniel's mystery. Now, if someone could, I know the quiz is over. This is not, I don't have prizes for you guys, but I have a question. If someone could, in their own words, what they, what they think is the main idea or the main, the main topic, the main theme of Daniel. Someone here could, is the mic still going around? Could someone share what they think is the main topic or the main idea of Daniel? What have you guys learned for the past week? What is the main topic and the main idea of Daniel? Sorry, could you repeat that again? To reveal the the second coming? Sorry. The secret things. To reveal the secret things in Daniel. That's true. It's to reveal what is hidden in the book of the Bible. The theme that we're doing now is to unlock the mysteries of Daniel. And if we're looking at the whole picture, if we're looking at the picture, it is all about the cross. You know, throughout Daniel chapter 1 all the way to Daniel maybe 9 and 10 and even 11, it is talking about these kingdoms, these great nations, but we will find out what it is all really about. What is the purpose of all this? And many of you have already learned this throughout the week, but tonight we will try to, to put our focus into what is really all about, what, is, what it is all really about. So before I begin, let us, show, let us sorry, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for your wonderful Sabbath. We thank you because you have given us the time to take one day of the week, to rest from our responsibilities, and more importantly, to be able to commune with you, O oh Lord, in a very personal manner. Lord God, tonight we ask for your Holy Spirit that you please be with my, my brothers and sisters here tonight, and especially to myself as I share your word, Lord. You know how unworthy I am, Lord, but by the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will empower me to be able to share the good news that is found in the book, the holy book, the Bible. This is my prayer. Amen. So before we can talk about everything about Daniel 10, 11, and 12, we need to start on the very first chapter, the very first chapter of Daniel. I don't think I put it on the slides. No, I did not. But we need to start on the very first chapter. And in the very first chapter, we have the story 
of Daniel and his friends and most of the people that were being captive, taken captive and brought to Babylon, right? So the story, this whole thing began with the Babylonians being able to overcome, to take captive and to triumph over the Israel nation. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, they are now under the hands of the Babylonians. And fast forward to our story today. Daniel chapter 10 verse 1 says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar at the time. That was the name given to him by the Babylonians. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. Now, first off, the year, the third year. When is, there was a question here a while ago, and I think it's related to this. When did the Babylonian rule started? Does anyone know? The Babylonian rule, when did it start? Babylonian rule from 605 BC to 539 BC. And who was the nation that overcome Babylonians? The Medo-Persians, right? Therefore, they, um, oh, I wasn't able to put it there. But in 539 BC, that's when Medo-Persia took over Babylon. And if we put three years, add three years, the third year of King Cyrus, Daniel wrote this on 535 BC. I just want to put it out there. That Daniel wrote the first, the Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 on 535 BC. Now, why is this important? Between 605 and 535 BC, there is 70 years, right? 70 years. Now, what is, what is a prophecy that is important about 70 years? There's the prophecy about Jesus, the 70 years prophecy of Daniel, but there's also the 70 prophecy of Jeremiah. You see, Jeremiah, he wrote um, in Jeremiah 25 verse 11 that this whole land shall be a ruin and a waste. Other version says it will be a desolate land. And 70 years, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. So when we first go back, 605 BC all the way to 535 BC, the prophecy of prophet Jeremiah of the 70 years of Israel's being in captive, being taken over by the Babylonians, the Babylonians are now about to finish. So why is this very important? Why is this, why am I adding this to my presentation, to my, to my message to you tonight? You see, Daniel was looking forward to going home. Daniel knew that the time of captivity under the Babylonian rule is about to finish. The time of the Jewish nation being captivated by the Babylonian Empire, they're about to be set free. However, Daniel wasn't looking forward to himself going home, but rather Daniel was looking forward to his people going home. He was looking forward to his, because by this time, does, does anyone know how old Daniel was when he went to Babylon? Around, he was, the Bible tells us he was in his teenage years. And his history predicts that he was, or um, estimates that he was 17 years old. So after 70 years, he's now about 87 years old. So he knows that he's not going home anymore. He's not going to go home anymore, but his people still has an opportunity to go home. And so what does he do? In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full week, weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, meat and wine doesn't mean that Daniel was eating meat or wine, right? It's, he says here that he was eating no meat or wine, but the focus was more on the mourning. Throughout this whole time, Daniel was mourning for three weeks. Why was he mourning? 
The reason why he was mourning is because of the people during that time, there were either two things. His people were afraid. Number one, they were afraid to go back home because they didn't know if they could rebuild their city or their country again. They didn't know that they could go back and start the nation all over again. They didn't know that if they had the proper resources, they had the proper strength, they had the proper equipment, and so on and so forth, to rebuild the nation back in Jerusalem. And during those times, the second reason why people weren't going home was because they were already accustomed to the life that they were already living in Babylon. They were already accustomed to the lifestyle that the Babylonians have already given and tried to assimilate them in. The people of Israel during that time, they had about one million people. They had about a million people, but the first, in, in the book of Ezra, the first group of people that went back to Israel or Jerusalem was about 50,000 people. So imagine a million people, out of a million people, there were only 50,000. So in this group of people, not even one person out of this group of people had went back to Israel. So Daniel was worrying about his people, and he was thinking, how can I help my people? How am I able to give my people a new life and a new beginning? Now I want to ask you, friends. We live in a world where we are accustomed to what we have here. Many of us are used to the social media. We're used to having um, the worldly things. We're used to going to school, making a living, having a family, working ourselves. But how often do we think about home? How often do we think about our heavenly home? How often do we think about going back to where we really belong? And who do we belong to? We were created by one creator only, and that is God. So how often, more than the times that we think about how we live now, do we think about the eternity that is about to come? And Daniel, in the same sense now, was worrying about his people. The verses goes on and says, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of upas. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Who do you think that picture represents? Jesus. Right, very good. Let's go to Revelations chapter 1, verse 13 to 16, and let's, let's look at the parallel. It says, And in the midst of the seven lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet. So in the first one, he was clothed with linen. Now he's clothed with garment. To the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So last time it was upas, and now it's a golden band. His head and hair were like white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seventy-seven stars. Out of his mouth was his, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When you pray, who do you think is the one that goes and approaches you and listens to you? Jesus. When you pray, who do you think is the one that affirms you? Who do you think is the one that answers your prayer? Who do you think is the one that is listening to all our prayers? It is Jesus. And in the same way, that same Jesus is the same one that has approached Daniel. Jesus is coming, and he is willing to answer all of your prayers. Now, an interesting thing is found in Daniel 10, verse 10 and 11. It says, Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble in my knees and on the palms of my hands. 
And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And verse 12 says, Then he said, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourselves before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Is there anyone here who has been praying for a long time, and up until now, they, their prayer has not been answered? Can anyone raise their hands? I'm one of them. Am I the only one? Am I? Whoa, praise the Lord. All of your prayers are answered. But I'm sure that many of us here, maybe their answers are, are, their prayers are answered, but they're not exactly sure how. But here in this story, we can tell the first day. How long was Daniel mourning for? According to the Bible, how long was he mourning for? Three weeks. And on the very first day, Daniel's prayer was already heard by God. And what else did it say? And he has become because of your words. God comes to us not because he loves us. Yes, that is a fact too. He comes to us because he loves us. But not only that. He also comes to us because He hears our words when we come to Him. Many times, I've heard people say that, um, that sometimes people are, or they don't feel that God is in their presence or that God is in their lives. But at the same time, those people have not yet asked for His presence. And here in this story, Daniel has come. And in the very, or, or rather, Jesus has come to Daniel on the very first day. Now the question is, if Jesus had come to Daniel and answered his prayer on the first day, why did he have to mourn for three whole weeks? He says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, or three weeks. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, I want you to picture this. You have a king, the king of Persia at that time, who had a million people under his command. An additional million people who had a right to tell what to do, a right to tell how to live, a right to tell how to do the way their life is. Imagine putting yourself in a situation. You are a queen, for many of us are ladies here, or many of you are ladies here, not me. But if you are in a leadership position, like King Cyrus, and he had a million people in his, under his hand, and he can control them however they want, do you think he would freely let go these people out of doing nothing? Imagine you have a million pesos that you were able to get because you were able to succeed in something. You were able to succeed in doing something and because of doing that something, now you have 10 million pesos. And having 10 million pesos, you can do whatever you want with it. And now Daniel, in this situation, or rather someone in this situation, let's say someone in this situation, has now come to you and is asking you to let go that 10 million pesos. Would you let go of that 10 million pesos? If a stranger person just comes up to you and says, give me that 10, 10 million pesos, would you, would you give them that 10 million pesos? Probably not. I don't think... Uh, normal person would do so. You see, the reason why Daniel had to mourn for three weeks is because God knew and God respects our freedom of choice. God respects our freedom of choice. So yes, he answered Daniel's prayer on the first day. So yes, God had the power to tell King Cyrus, hey, let the, the, the one million people of mine go and go home. 
But because of his respect to his personal choice, God had to work his divine power through the heart, through the heart of the king. And he had to fight off the enemy who had caused him to captive or be in control of these people. So Daniel, when we pray, just like Daniel, whether we see it or not, our prayers are being answered. God is working when we are praying. We may not see it happening right now. We may not see it working right now. We may not see it working even after a long time. But the truth is, and the fact is, the very moment that we cry out to God, our, our prayers are already answered. Now, Daniel 11 is a very, now, Daniel 10, rather, is just an introduction to Daniel 11. Daniel 10 is like the introductory, Daniel 11 is like the body, and Daniel 12 is like the conclusion, okay? So now we're going to the body. But before we do that, let's look at Daniel 7. What did we learn in Daniel 7? Kingdom of God, it says there. The Daniel 7, we learned about the four beasts, right? And it talked about at the end of those four beasts, someone will rise up against those four beasts. Daniel 8 talks about the truth of God. It talks about the little horn and the power of the little horn rep represented, representing the blasphemy against God. Now, Daniel 11 is very important. And to be honest, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When, when we first planned for this, this seminar, I had no idea about Daniel 11. I had no idea about the contents. To, to, I'm gonna be vulnerable here. I'm a, I'm a COT student, but before we planned this seminar, I have never read fully Daniel chapter 11. Anyone here has read Daniel chapter 11 fully? Mark, the pastor maybe, Pastor Kabasan, some of us maybe. Daniel chapter 11, if Daniel 7 is talking about the kingdom and Daniel 8 is talking about the truth, Daniel 11 is talking about you and me. We have learned about the kingdom of God. We have learned about the truth of God. And now we are going to learn about us, the people of God. So let's start in Daniel 11 verse 1. It says there, In the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. This is Daniel talking about him being close with the king. And now I will tell you the truth. He receives another prophecy or another vision. And he says, Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. What did we learn in the previous chapters about the beast? Who, what did we learn about Medo and Persia? How many kings happened, or how many kings took control of Medo and Persia? There were four in total. There were four total kings that, remember that they were split into um, kind of like the beast with the four heads. Um, so there were four totals, kings, and the fourth one shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So just starting in this chapter, we can see that alignment between the previous prophecies about the kingdom. So Daniel 2, 7, and 8, then the beginning of chapter 11 is just about connecting the dots. So in those times, first of all, there was King Cyrus, 539 to 530. You remember when Babylon was over, there was King Cyrus. And then there was King Cambyses, 530 to 522, and King Gaumata, 522. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly. And then there was King Darius in 522 to 486 BC. But 11, chapter 11, verse 3 is very interesting. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. What have we learned about Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great is the one who conquered the, almost the whole world, or pretty much the whole world during his time. And 
this verse tells us that from Daniel 2 to 7 to 8 and to now, everything is still accurate. Everything that the Bible is telling us is still very accurate. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and be divided toward the four winds of heaven. Remember about this again, how Alexander the Great split up into four governors after his death? But not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion, with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So up until now, Bible is still accurate. Now, fast forward a little bit. Not sure if I put this here. Um, so I'll go back to those slides in a little bit. So Daniel chapter 2, we learn about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Same thing in Daniel 7. In Daniel 8, we learn mostly about Medo-Persia and Greece, right? Now Daniel 11 talks about the taxes of Roman Empire. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, this is what it says. There shall arise in his place one who, is, who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdoms, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. If we look in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should, should be registered. Who is Caesar Augustus? Anyone know? Caesar is the empire of Rome. And after, after Greece had overcome, there was the Rome who took over, right? And Caesar, why would he ask that everyone should be registered? He asked that everyone should be registered so that he could know how much money or how much profit they could take if they had taxed the people. He had to figure out how he could, he wanted to know how much you know, how much his people would be worth. And so going on, the Roman Empire introduced the tax through Caesar. So again, just like Daniel 2 and 7, we have first the Babylonians, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, then the Roman Empire. Now, now that we have put that aside, that there is now this group of, or this from Daniel 2 to 7 to 8 and to 11, everything is still accurate. Everything in the Bible is still extremely accurate. Nothing has fallen short. But what comes now after the Roman Empire? What happens now? What happens to us and to the world? Daniel 11 verse 21 says, And in his place, shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by entreat. If we go back to our studies in the past few days, do we have someone who represents a vile person? In the words of perhaps Blasphemous words, pompous words. You see, now Daniel is trying to connect the dots, and we are trying to see what he's actually trying to say. So here's a little overview. This is what I was looking for a while ago. So before we go on into verse 22, let's look into, so we started with Persia. We started with Persia. And then they were split up. There were four kings in Persia. And after the fourth king, King Darius, Alexander the Great and the Greeks took over. And they were split up into four kings as well. The four winds, right? Now in Daniel 5.15, it talks about the historical kings of the north and the south. Now I apologize because this is now when I ran out of time and I wasn't able to finish my presentation. Um, just like I said a while ago, I didn't have much time to do it. But I just want to talk a little bit. It's not on the screen, but I just want to talk a little bit about 
these kings, the historical kings of the north and the south. Okay? So, do we know the geographical location of Israel? Does anyone know the geographical location of Israel? It is in the Middle East, right? And do we know what country is above Israel? Does anyone know what country is above Israel? So say if this is Israel right here, what is the country right above Israel? It is Babylon. Right above, right above Israel is an area which is predominantly known to be the nation of Babylon. And underneath it, do we know the opposite country? The south? In the south, there is the Egyptian country or the Egyptian empire. So Israel is right in the middle and, and Babylon is right on top. And then Egyptians is right underneath. And during these times, in between verses 5 and 15, Daniel talks about how, excuse me, Daniel talks about how the king of the north and the king of the south continues to fight and battle against each other. Now, why would they be battling against each other? Why would they be battling against one another? If we look back in time, remember that, look in the statues, if we look in the beast, each one has one general theme. It has one specific theme, and that is how every nation and every great leader tried to conquer the whole world. They tried to conquer everything that was going on and tried to be the king of the world, try to be the best in the world. They tried to overcome everything that they, their arms could reach out to. And so during these times, we're not going to go deep into them because we don't have much time. But the general essence of, of 15 or 5 to 15 is how the Israelite nation is in between the north, the king of the north, and the king of the south, of how they are trying to fight for power. And we, the Israelite nation, is in the center of all this. And now what happens after they are fighting, the Babylons and not necessarily the Babylons, but just the area of Babylons and the Egyptians, is that after that, in verse 20 that we read a while ago, is the imperial Rome. Caesar Augustus has now overcome the world and he is trying to tax the world. He is trying to take control of the world and not only take control of it, but take money from the world. This was the description that we knew about um, Rome. Now, 23 to 39, it talks about papal Rome. And rather than reading each verse, I just pinpointed out specific verses of the characteristics of this time or this specific nation. So Daniel 11, starting in Daniel 11, verse 31, or Before we go there, I was not able to put it on, but if you have your Bibles with you tonight, can you go to Daniel chapter 11, verse 27? This is an important, important note to read on before we continue. I'll read it for you. It says, Daniel 11, verse 27, both these kings, so talking about the king of the north and the king of the south, both these kings' heart shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. So now a time will come, a time will come when these two kings, the one in the north of the Israelite, and the one in the south of the Israelites will share the same table. They will share the same table and they will try to cooperate with each other to try to control the rest of the world, but they will never be able to succeed. They shall speak lies towards each other. They will try to coordinate and work together, but they will never be successful. 
And keep in mind that the Israelite nation is in between all of this. And what does it say in verse 31? Now a force shall be mustered by him. So this, these two kings, these two kings um, be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. So now at this time, we're now shifting between the physical and the terrestrial kingdom of the north and the south. And now we're shifting into the spiritual or religious, religious aspect of overcoming. So the king of the north shall be overtaking the sacrifices. They will, sh they will take away the sacrifices and they will place there the abomination of desolation. What do you think is the daily sacrifices? What do you think is the daily sacrifices that the people or that would be taken away from the people? What do you think it would be a place of abomination and desolation? Abomination and desolation simply means there would be nothing but perhaps a good way to put it is nothing but death. It's a desolate land where there is nothing living in that land. And what does Jesus say about living? He said that he is the way, the truth, and the, the life. And if there is a land of, no, if, of abomination and desolation, that means there is no more life. Meaning to say, if there is no more life, life equals to sacrifices. Our sacrifices, or rather our daily devotion to the Lord, equals to our life through him and the king of the north will rise up and muster and they will use its power to make sure that there will be no more sacrifices no more power or no more ability for the Israelite nation to have life what else does he do the king shall do according to his own will he shall exalt and magnify himself above, above every God shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been done, has been determined, shall be done. So not only will he take away the daily sacrifices of the people, this king will also do everything in his will. And what is in his heart? He shall exalt and magnify himself. Where is the evil? And he will speak blasphemies against the God of gods. Meaning to say this king, not only will he prevent the people from doing their daily sacrifices, but he will also put himself above the living God. And he will put himself in place of the God on whom these people have been offering sacrifices to. And he will prosper until the wrath will come. Now, it would be very sad if the verse says that he shall prosper forever, right? It would be very, um, it would be a tragedy for us if, if this, this king, who the Bible tells us will take our sacrifices, our daily sacrifices, and will do everything in his own will, evil things. It will be a tragedy if he will prosper forever. However, it says he will prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. What is that wrath? What is that wrath? We will find out. Daniel chapter 11 verse 40. The king of the north continues his conquest. The king of the north continues his conquest. At the time of the end of the king of the north, the king of the south shall attack him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, who is the king of the south? Again, remember, there is the Israelite nation, and above there is the Babylonian area, Babylonian king. Specifically, um, the name of the king is Ptolemy I, in the king of the south. Sorry, the king of the south is King Ptolemy I, and the king of the north is... Um, King Seleucus. I don't know how to pronounce those names. But in an essence, there is the one in the king of the north, 
and there's the one in the king of the south. And these two kings have now been overcome by the Roman Empire, and now they are now sharing, not necessarily overcome, but they are now sharing the same table. They are now sharing the same table, and remember what the Bible says, they will never come into accordance. In verse 27, or in verse 27, they shall speak lies to one another, they shall speak pompous words, and they will never come into accordance. But while they're, they're sharing the same table and while they're lying to each other, the king in the north, the one, the, the one of the kings, will do its work, will prevent the people from making living sacrifices, and not only that, he will do the evilness that it is in his heart. And then there will come a time while he is doing all of this, while the king of the north is doing all of this, that the king of the south shall try to attack him. In other words, there will be someone who is trying to fight and take the Israelite people from the hands of the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. And I'll be very honest with you, up until now, it's still unsure for myself who exactly the king of the south and the king of the north is. But what I do know is that they are descendants of the same people that was in verse 27. They are the group of people who are now sharing a table and trying to take control of the world. They are trying to take control of this world that we are living in now. And they are doing evil things, and they, were, they are doing pompous things to try the evilness or to try and fulfill the evilness in their heart. Verse 41 says, The same one will enter the glorious land. The glorious land is Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Amma. Does anyone know who Edom, Moab, and Ammon is? Does anyone know who that represents? Remember when I said that the Israelite people were in the center, the king of the north is on top, and the king of the south is in the south, in the bottom? Edom, Moab, and Ammon are countries surrounding Israel and these are representing the people who are still trying to be in Israel trying to live and have daily sacrifices trying to not fall against the evil king who is trying to change the world trying to overcome the world so these people there will be a group of people who will escape from the hand of the king how will they escape? Or rather, what's going to happen after they escape? News from the east, and the north shall trouble him. Or there will be news from the east, and the king north shall be troubled. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. I know those are all very confusing, because even I, when I studied it, it was very confusing for myself. But again, here's the picture. There is, the, there is Israel in the middle, and there is the king of the north, and there is the king of the south. And while this is happening, they will try to overcome the world specifically, and most importantly, Israel who is right in the middle. They will try to conquer us. And there will be, there will be news that will come in, from the east. And what is that news? You know, we are in living now. Now, the Israelites are now living in this time where they are being conquered by two nations. And there is a news that will come, and the news is found in 45. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Before we go to the second part, let's talk about the first part. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas. What does sea represent? In Bible times, sea represents the multitudes of people. 
the one who will come from the east will gather his palace or will set his palace in the people, meaning the people who are in between the battle of Israel or of the north and of the south. And the glorious holy mountain, remember the glorious city or the glorious land is Israel. And now yet he, this is talking about the king of the north, he shall come to his end and no one will help him. The king of the north will be taken over. Yes, he is triumphing. Yes, he is overcoming. But there will come a time where the, the news from the east will come and take over. Um, okay. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, and we are ending now. And we're just going to read the last three verses, or the, the first three verses, rather, of Daniel 12. Starting in verse 1, it says, At the time Michael shall stand up. Who is Michael? Jesus. In all the accounts of, in all the, accounts of the Bible, Michael is used for the angel that represents Jesus Christ. The great, the great prince who stands, who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was when there was a nation, even to that time, at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Verse one is telling us that the king or the prince, the great prince, that um, Michael will come and he will stand watch over the people while the people are facing this struggle. There will never be a peace and there will come a time of trouble. He will come when everyone is in desolation, when everyone is in abomination, when everyone is no longer able to make living sacrifices, when no one is, when no one is able to make um, daily living for the Lord. The time of desolation is happening soon. And for some parts of the world, it is happening right now. Yes, Daniel chapter, or the whole book of Daniel is talking about the time, the literal time of during those days. But it is also talking about the prophetic time of us today. We've learned through the previous nights about Babylon, medo persian about um, Greeks, and the Roman Empire. And now we are learning about the rock that is about to come. Daniel chapter 12 is talking about that rock. That prince is coming during the time of trouble. And at the time, your people, he's talking to, to Daniel, your people shall be delivered. The Israelite people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found in the, and written in the book of life. Many of those, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and some to everlasting conscience. We're learning now about the resurrection, the time when the dead will rise, and some will go to heaven with Christ, and some will perish. In verse 3, it says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteous, like the stars forever and ever. I want to end with verse 5, or verse 4 rather. It says, But you, Daniel, shut up your words and seal the book until the time of the end, and many shall run to and fro, and the knowledge shall increase. So here's the picture, and I will try to share to you what I've learned. We are now living in that time. We are the same people in between the king of the north and in the king of the south. We are the one who is, who is being taken, our daily sacrifices are being taken from us. And the evilness of the one who has taken it from us has now doing his best to do whatever his heart wills. All the evilness, all the pompous, the blasphemous things in his heart he is trying to do it and trying to fulfill his desire in the world. 
And we, a little nation in between these kings, have no power to do anything. And just like the Bible tells us, we are living in a time of trouble. There is a time when we can no longer worship. There will be a time when we can no longer make our daily sacrifices. And like I said, some parts of the world are now experiencing that. And there will come a time when it will feel like, it will feel like the king of the north and the king of the south, one of them will come triumphant and it feel like there will nothing that will be able to overcome them. I want to go back to this verse. Um, the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god every God in this world. He shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. His wrath, this king, his evilness will prosper. His evilness will triumphant. His evilness will be accomplished. His evil desires and his evil will will be fulfilled. But there will come a time and we know that time is soon. The news from the east will come. And who is that news? That is the one who is named Michael. That is the one who is named Michael in, verse, in chapter 12. And he is the one who will come. And he will look for the ones who is written on the book. He will look for the one who is written in the book of life. Yes, there will be troubles there will be trials. There will be a time when the enemy will seem like he has finally and completely overcome. But even after all that, our Jesus Christ will come and he will lift up the dead and he will bring them to heaven. And there will come a time in verse 4, it says, Many will run to and fro. Meaning to say, many will search the books of Daniel. Many will search the Bible and look for, for the way of life. Many will look for how to gain eternal life. Many will look for how to overcome this evil. And many shall, their knowledge shall be increased. Many will be successful in looking for these knowledges. Many will be successful in increasing the, the knowledge about the future. And that future is actually the present. The future is now. Now we learn throughout the book of Daniel that kingdoms will come after kingdoms and after kingdoms and after kingdoms. But aren't we glad that the last kingdom that will stand tall and stand strong is the kingdom of God. Aren't we glad that the final book of Daniel ends not with Greece, not with Babylon, not with Medo-Persia, or not with Rome, but it ends with the rock that was formed out of nothing, that will strike up all these kingdoms. And Michael shall stand tall and mighty. Jesus Christ will stand tall and mighty. He is the great news from the East. He is the great news that has come to you and to me. And He is trying to tell you that He has overcome the North, the South, and any other kings in this world. He has overcome everything that is trying to take you and me from His hands. And so I pray, and I know that I, I firmly, or rather, I understand that it is a very confusing subject. It is a very difficult thing to, to talk about or to understand. But what we do know is that all these things align with each other. Kings have come and come and come, and there will be one king. If all of the things that are happened throughout the prophecy of Daniel are true, and in fact they are because even history supports it, then we can be sure that the final prophecy that is about to come 
which is Michael, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will stand tall for you and me. And he will go against the enemy. And the Bible tells us that he will overcome the enemy, no matter how powerful the enemy may seem, that Michael and his angels will stand true for you and for me. with our message tonight, let us all stand and sing. I want to be ready for... 